In this lecture, we'll discuss more about the second law of thermodynamics. In particular, we'll look at some applications of the second law. Then we'll discuss the concept of entropy generation. And finally, we'll look at the relation between entropy and disorder. In the previous lecture, we have seen that starting from the comparison of efficiencies of reversible and irreversible heat engines, we have given a proof of the second part of the second law. And earlier, we have compared the efficiencies of different reversible engines and shown them to be equal. And from that, we arrived at the so-called proof of the first part of the second law. So what in a nutshell we have done is that we've looked at the efficiencies of heat engines and given the justification for the first and the second part of the second law. So in the last lecture, all we did is to show that the principle that entropy of an isolated system can never decrease is plausible based on the comparison of an irreversible heat engine and a reversible heat engine. So this statement of the second part of the second law is required to generalize this conclusion for all types of processes and these processes could be those where there might be some mass transfer taking place within the system. There could be chemical reactions. So although we've looked at a very simple example of a heat engine and we've shown that such a statement should be valid, that that is not the conclusive proof of the second law. In fact, what it tells is that this statement is plausible based on the example of an irreversible heat engine. So the statement of second law is required to generalize this conclusion to all types of processes and we cannot prove the statements of the second law and that's why they have been introduced as a law but we cannot either wait to examine all conceivable processes before we can generalize. So till now no prediction that has been based on this equation has been wrong and hence we treat it as a law of nature. Therefore, hereafter to analyze any process, we may start our analysis solely based on this equation rather than any intermediate result such as the Clausius inequality. The Clausius inequality may now be considered as the consequence of this statement which is far more general that has been introduced by the second law. Now to show that we can arrive at the Clausius inequality starting with this more general statement that applies to any kind of process. So what we do is that let's consider a closed system and this system is in contact with a thermal reservoir, let's say at temperature T. Now, if you look at this combined system of this control mass and the thermal reservoir, so this is our control mass and this is our thermal reservoir, then the combined system is an isolated system. Therefore, for this combined system, we are going to apply this particular equation. Now, consider that this thermal reservoir supplies heat dq to this system. Therefore, the entropy of the system, let's say, increases in this differential process by ds, while the entropy of the thermal reservoir decreases by amount dq by t because the temperature of the thermal reservoir is not going to change. So if 
you look at the combined system that is this isolated system its entropy change is ds that is of the control mass and minus d cube by t that is of the thermal reservoir and the second part of the second law says that entropy of an isolated system cannot decrease therefore this must be greater than equal to zero and note that this temperature t is temperature of the thermal reservoir that supplies heat dq to that system now if at every step let's say the control mass exchanges heat with in general different thermal reservoirs so we may bring in different thermal reservoirs while the system evolves from let's say state 1 to state 2 then what we will have is if we integrate this equation we will get that is the change in entropy of this control mass when it evolves from state 1 to state 2 is greater than or equal to this integral and note that equality holds for a reversible process only now it is clear that in this equation also t is the temperature of the thermal reservoir that supplies heat and there could be different thermal reservoirs in this process as the system evolves from state 1 to state 2 and for the cyclic process s2 minus s1 is going to be zero because the system would come back to its original state and we can write this equation as the cyclic integral of dq by t is less than equal to zero and this is our Clausius inequality and again note that in the Clausius inequality t is the temperature of the thermal reservoir as we have seen this throughout our current discussion now if we have a reversible cycle or a reversible process so in this equation and in this equation then there is no distinction between the temperatures of the system and that of the reservoir because the heat is being added reversibly if there is a temperature difference between the system and the reservoir then there would be irreversibilities and if there is a temperature gradient within the system again there would be irreversibilities so for equality to hold we must have that this temperature is equal to the temperature of the system and the temperature is same throughout the system and that is the only case when we can have equality whereas for a system undergoing an irreversible process the temperature of the thermal reservoir t that comes in these inequalities must be greater than equal to that of the system in fact for a system undergoing an irreversible process the temperature within the system can also vary but the temperature of the thermal reservoir must be greater than that of that part of the system that receives heat in general because heat we are saying is being added by the thermal reservoir to the system and it can also be equal because even if the temperature of the thermal reservoir is equal to that of the system the system may undergo irreversible processes such as let's say dissipative processes involving friction or mixing of gases which all are irreversible processes therefore to summarize this discussion what we can say is that from this equation we can write ds is greater than dq over t and delta s is greater than equal to this and in all these inequalities the equality holds only for a system undergoing a reversible process and there are no sorts of irreversibilities
So now that we understand how we have arrived at this equation from the general principle that entropy of an isolated system cannot decrease, we can draw various interesting inferences from this particular equation. So the first thing to note is that if we have dq equals to 0, that is, a system undergoes an adiabatic process, then if we substitute dq equals to 0 in this equation, what we get is ds is greater than equal to 0. But in addition, if the process is reversible and also adiabatic, then equality will also apply and for such processes we have ds will be exactly equal to 0 and such a process therefore is called an isentropic process. However, if a process is adiabatic, that does not mean always that the process is isentropic and this is not always true and we've already seen an example where we had this adiabatic walls of a cylinder in which there were two gases that were initially separated by a partition and then those gases eventually mixed after removal of this partition. So that process was adiabatic but there was a finite change in the entropy and therefore it was not isentropic. So for an adiabatic process to be isentropic it must be reversible. All reversible adiabatic processes are isentropic but the opposite is not always true. That means all isentropic processes need not be reversible and adiabatic and we can understand this by considering this equation again. So we have ds is greater than equal to dq over t and now we want to look at isentropic processes only and by isentropic process we mean ds equals to zero. So if we substitute this into this inequality what we get is dq is less than equal to zero and this is the criteria for an isentropic process. So if the process is isentropic, this inequality must hold. And equality holds only for a reversible process. So what we see is that if a process is isentropic and it is reversible, then it must be adiabatic because dq will be equal to zero. But if a process is isentropic, even if we have dq less than zero, we can have a process to be isentropic, but it won't be reversible. That is, we may have an irreversible process in which heat is being removed from the system and the entropy of the system remains constant. To look at an example of such a process, let's consider an experiment similar to that of the Joules experiment. So what we have is we have a tank that is filled with a fluid and we have a paddle wheel that is being rotated by this falling weight under gravity. Now we'll look at this experiment with some variation this time. So now the whole of the tank is not insulated. So only three walls over here are adiabatic and the bottom wall is diathermal. And this wall, let's say, is in contact with a thermal reservoir 
whose temperature is T. So there can be heat transfer between this fluid and this thermal reservoir. So now consider that we have this system that is this fluid contained within this tank. Similar to the Joule's experiment, as this weight slowly lowers down, it rotates the paddle wheel and it tends to increase the internal energy or temperature of this fluid. But this fluid is in thermal contact with this reservoir, so it loses heat to this thermal reservoir. So the net effect is that this falling weight does work W on the system, but there is heat loss Q from the system. So the heat loss from the system is exactly equal to the work that is done on the system and therefore the state of the fluid does not change. By that we mean that its temperature and volume remains the same. So in nutshell because the state of this system that is the fluid does not change and we know that entropy is a state property therefore we can say that entropy of this fluid does not change but the entropy of the thermal reservoir increases because the heat that is rejected to this thermal reservoir is exactly equal to the work that has been supplied and therefore the increase in entropy of the thermal reservoir is equal to W by T and that of the system is zero because its state does not change. So one thing to note is that if you consider the whole of this system which is an isolated system so sum of these two is greater than zero obviously because the whole process is irreversible the, the weight that has fallen once cannot go up by extracting heat from this thermal reservoir because that would violate the kelvin planck statement as this system whose state does not change is taking heat q from the thermal reservoir and it is raising weight. If you consider that process, then it clearly it is a violation of the Kelvin Planck statement. So what we've seen from this example is that the entropy change of the system is zero, but the process is irreversible. And that is because the system is losing heat Q. So the idea is that whatever entropy is being generated is being lost to this reservoir and therefore the net change of entropy of this system is zero. But if you look at the whole system combined that is an isolated system consisting of this fluid and the reservoir then the entropy of the isolated system is certainly increasing. Now let us consider another example to illustrate the second law. So consider that we have a hot metallic ball which has temperature T1 initially and this ball is immersed in a bath of fluid at temperature T0. And let us say that the temperature of this liquid bath is less than the initial temperature of this metallic ball. And the bath is so large that its temperature T0 it does not change even after this ball loses heat to this bath and finally attains a temperature T0. Now clearly this process is an irreversible process because once this metallic ball has cooled down it cannot spontaneously go back to its original state by extracting heat from this liquid bath. But to look at this explicitly to see whether the entropy of this combined system that is an isolated system is increasing or not let's calculate the change in entropy of this combined system now assuming that the heat capacity of this ball to be constant we can say that the total heat that is lost to this thermal reservoir is c times t1 
minus T naught and this is the heat that is lost to the thermal reservoir. Therefore, the change in entropy of the bath which we are treating to be a thermal reservoir is equal to the heat that it has received over the temperature T naught of the bath. Whereas the entropy change of the ball that is cooling from initial temperature T1 to temperature T0 is if we apply the relation that we derived last time and let's do it again. So this is the entropy change if we had removed the heat reversibly then if we went from temperature T1 to T0 we would have got this relation but note that in this particular process we might not have this reversible cooling of this ball but still we can apply this expression for entropy change because we know the initial and the final state and entropy change does not depend upon the path that the system has taken because it's a property of the system so the ball may cool while having internal irreversibilities such as temperature gradients but because the initial and the final states are equilibrium states we can apply this formula which we have derived assuming a reversible process to this irreversible process as well so next consider this combined system of the ball and the bath and this is an isolated system because it has no energy interaction with the surroundings. So the total entropy change of this isolated system is equal to C log T0 by T1 plus this quantity And note that T0 is less than T1, so we can alternatively write this as minus C log T1 by T0 to explicitly tell that this quantity is negative and this term is positive. Now, if we take delta T to be T1 minus T0, we can write this equation as minus c so t1 will be t0 plus delta t so t1 by t0 would be 1 plus delta t over t0 and this term would be c delta t over t0 now clearly if you plot these two terms so let's say if you look at the plot of let's say delta t by t naught it would be a straight line whereas if you look at the plot of log 1 plus delta t by t naught so at delta t by t naught equal to 0 it would take a 0 value and log of 1 plus delta t by t naught would always be below this straight line so this is the plot of log of 1 plus delta t by t naught so if you look at the difference that is always going to be greater than or equal to 0 and equality would be when delta t is equal to 0 and that is a trivial case where the bath temperature is equal to the initial temperature of the ball and therefore it is a reversible process now in this particular case we have the entropy of this isolated system that is the net entropy is positive because this combined system undergoes an irreversible process because of the heat transfer over finite temperature difference in fact if we keep on reducing this temperature difference let's say if delta t by t naught was significantly less than 1 then you can see that we can approximate this equation as so if we take 
let's say x is equal to delta t by t naught so we have c times x from this term minus c times log of 1 plus x and we can expand this term in series so we have c times x so the series expansion of log of 1 plus x we can write as x minus x squared by 2 plus x cubed by 3 and so on and so forth and now let's look at the overall expression so cx would cancel out and we get c x squared by 2 minus c x cubed by 3 so when x is much less than 1 we can see that this term that is delta s of this isolated system tends to 0 so what we can say is that this entropy generation or production of entropy is because we have heat transfer over finite temperature difference and when this temperature difference goes down we tend to a reversible process in fact you can consider a problem where we have infinitely large number of baths having slightly different temperatures and you change the temperature of this ball by first dipping in this bath and then going to a bath with slightly different temperature and therefore in this se sequence if you take the ball from temperature t1 to t0 so these reservoirs have slightly different temperature then you can see that you will get exactly delta s equals to zero because you can reversibly change the temperature of the ball if you have infinitely large number of thermal reservoirs with infinitesimally small difference in temperatures while taking the system from first state to the final state and i'll leave that as an exercise for you so what we've seen through this example is that there is some kind of entropy generation due to irreversibilities so what do we mean by entropy generation now often the second part of the second law is expressed in terms of entropy generation so to understand what we mean by entropy generation so what we've seen is that ds is greater than or equal to dq over t or delta s is greater than this integral where t is the temperature of the thermal reservoirs that are brought in contact with the system during the process then entropy generation which we'll call as s subscript gen is defined as delta s minus this integral from this inequality we know that this entropy generation must always be greater than equal to zero and equality holds for a reversible process only and this is what we call as entropy generation s gen so because entropy generation depends on the process it is not a property of the system the concept of entropy generation is often used while discussing the second law applied to a control volume that we are going to discuss in the next lecture. So for a small amount of heat that is added to the system we can also write starting with this equation that the differential entropy generation which is an inexact differential because it depends upon the process is equal to ds minus dq by t where we must have this quantity to be greater than equal to zero and that follows from the second part of the second law so if we write this equation as this then we can think of this equation as the net change in entropy of the system is equal to the entropy that is 
transferred by the thermal reservoir to the system so we can call this as entropy transfer or the flux of entropy to the system plus the entropy that is generated within the system so we'll return to this viewpoint while discussing the second law for the control volume where we can see what are the fluxes of entropy and what is the entropy that is being generated within the system to do an overall entropy balance now let us look at entropy generation in the various examples that we have considered till now so if we look at this example we know that the state of the fluid remains the same so we have delta s is equal to zero but clearly this process is irreversible so what's happening is that if we write the change in entropy of the system is equal to the entropy that is generated during this process plus the flux so in this case we have heat which is equal to the work is being transferred from the system to the thermal reservoir so we have this is the entropy that is leaving this boundary of the system so what we see is that entropy change of the system is zero and that's because whatever entropy we are generating within this system due to this irreversible process of friction that is generated by this paddle wheel is leaving the system and is dumped to the thermal reservoir and the net effect is that there is no change in entropy of this fluid so this is how the concept of entropy generation can alternatively be used to understand the irreversible processes now let's go back to this particular example where this metallic ball is being cooled by immersion in a liquid bath so in this example if delta s is the change in entropy of our metallic ball which we consider as the system then and we know that the entropy change of the reservoir is q over t naught again in this example heat is being transferred out of this system so the change in entropy is equal to the entropy that is generated within the system and the entropy that is leaving the system that is q over t naught and because this entropy generation is greater than or equal to zero that's why we have this particular equation so you can either think in terms of entropy generation to be always uh, greater than equal to zero as the second part of this of the second law and another way to look at is the entropy of the isolated system is greater than equal to zero so both pictures are fine so in this example entropy is being generated because there's heat transfer due to a finite temperature difference so clearly if you look at this so this term is our entropy change of the system this is this term q over t naught and therefore entropy generation is equal to this in this particular process and we have seen that if we keep on reducing the temperature difference then our entropy generation would tend to zero therefore entropy generation in this example is due to heat transfer over finite temperature difference so to summarize what we've done till now is that we've seen various examples and none of the examples contradict the fact that during a spontaneous or a real process the entropy of an isolated system cannot decrease in all the examples entropy of an isolated system increases and note that entropy in an isolated system may decrease locally but it is compensated by a greater increase in entropy elsewhere so that this inequality is always valid this means that entropy 
of a closed system may decrease during a process without violating the second law. But the decrease in entropy of a closed system is accompanied by a greater increase in entropy of the surroundings such that the entropy of the combined isolated system consisting of our control mass and the surroundings always increases. This is often stated in terms of that the entropy of the universe always increases. But uh, we'll always stick to this convention that we'll consider this combined system as an isolated system and universe, if you combine everything, then entropy of the universe is also uh, increasing because universe, you can treat it as an isolated system. So what we've seen for any irreversible process, the entropy of an isolated system increases, but if an isolated system attains equilibrium, what it means is that its entropy can no longer increase because if the system has attained equilibrium, it means that there's no possibility of that system to undergo another irreversible process. Therefore, the entropy of an isolated system at equilibrium will be maximum. Because if you say that the entropy of the isolated system increases from this equilibrium state, that means the system is undergoing an irreversible process. That means the system would not be originally in the equilibrium state. Therefore, entropy is maximum at the equilibrium state. That means ds is equal to zero for an isolated system at equilibrium. Because once the system attains equilibrium, there would be no further change in the entropy of the isolated system. Finally, let's look at the relation between entropy and disorder. Now, in classical thermodynamics, we do not deal with the microscopic changes within the system. However, some understanding of the microscopic origins of entropy can be helpful in appreciating the concept of entropy. Now, unlike most quantities in science, entropy of a system and its surroundings is not conserved. So, let us consider certain natural processes to appreciate the concept of entropy. Now, first, let's consider the process of sublimation, such as that of solid carbon dioxide which sublimates to the vapor phase. So the sublimation process takes place at constant temperature and the change in entropy during the sublimation process is the heat absorbed during the sublimation process divided by the temperature that is the sublimation temperature. Therefore the entropy during the sublimation process always increases. Now on the microscopic level during sublimation what we have is that the solid has molecules or particles in ordered state whereas when these molecules go into the vapor phase they are relatively disordered because these molecules have more freedom to move around. Therefore, an increase in entropy can be described as an increase in disorder of the system. Another example, uh, if we consider, is that of the free expansion of an idle gas. So in free expansion, what we have is that there is a tank that is insulated and the gas is initially filled in one part of this tank and the other part has vacuum, that is it is evacuated. So once you remove this partition, this idle gas is going to fill this whole tank and in during this process because if you consider the walls are rigid and 
the walls are also adiabatic so there's no change in the internal energy and there's going to be no change in the temperature of the idle gas because the in, uh, internal energy of the idle gas is a function of temperature only so in this case there is no heat transfer and the temperature is also constant still the entropy of this isolated system increases and we've also seen an example where we had two gases in the chamber at different pressures and in that case also the temperature did not change but the entropy increases and this is because upon expansion of the gas or mixing of gases if we have gases in two chambers the gas molecules have more space for the motion after removal of the partition so even if there is no structural change as in the sublimation process there is more disorder accompanied with more freedom for gas molecules to move around and therefore the entropy of the system increases if you look at this example again of the joule experiment but in contact with a thermal reservoir in this case the state of the fluid remains same so the increase in entropy is that of the reservoir which receives heat so what happens is that this orderly motion of the weight that is falling down gives way to more disorderly motion of particles within the thermal reservoir so all these examples are those of irreversible processes and these irreversible processes show that the entropy of the isolated system increases from a microscopic point of view these irreversible processes lead to more disorder in the isolated system or the universe therefore the increase in entropy is associated with an increase in disorder because all processes in this world are irreversible for example you have a cup that falls down and it breaks it is irreversible process aging of a person is also an irreversible process therefore all spontaneous processes ultimately involve increase in disorder of the system and the surroundings and an associated increase in entropy therefore we can say that entropy is the arrow of time and this arrow points towards the future and it cannot be reversed